Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, welcome to this webinar by Quintelect on AML CFP priorities in the Pacific. My name is Shirish Patak. I work at Quintelect, and it is my pleasure to be your host today for this webinar. Uh, as some of you may already know, Quintelect is a specialist in research, training, and advisory in AML, CFT, and financial crime compliance. And over the last two decades, we have worked closely with regulators as well as reporting entities in their capacity building efforts. Our work impacts compliance officers from over 75 countries around the world, uh, something that I think we've been able to achieve or rather been forced to achieve because everything went digital since the pandemic hit us. Uh, many of you would also be aware that in our efforts to democratize AML CFT education, we recently launched Fintlet Academy, which provides on-demand access to high quality, practical, informative, and actionable AML CFT compliance training content that is developed by experienced practitioners, former regulators, and industry experts. The platform provides courses broken down by over 20 categories within AML CFT. And I would actually urge each of you to register free and gain access to a vast number of video training sessions on AML CFT that we have both curated as well as created. Uh, over 80% of the content is free to view and the remaining is available at a very, very low annual subscription fee. So our inspiration for this really came from Netflix. Uh, earlier, you know, we used to buy tickets to see a single movie. Now one can watch an unlimited number of movies at a fixed subscription fee. We have done the same with Fintlet Academy. Uh, there are no individual course fees for a low subscription. One can complete over 35 certificate courses at your pace and depending on your need and interest. Uh, a couple of housekeeping announcements before we start the session. Uh, all participants who are attending this session live will receive a free participation certificate. For this, you have to make a registration on Fintlet Academy so that the certificate can be generated for you. Also, uh, whenever you have a question, please post it uh, in the Q&A window. We will have a combined Q&A session with audience at the end and we'll take as many questions as possible. Uh, there will also be a recording of today's webinar, which will be available later on in case uh, you wish to refer to it again, or if you wish to uh, refer it to colleagues or friends who would like to see it. Uh, this link will be emailed to you uh, tomorrow. Uh, today, we will start the webinar with a presentation by my esteemed colleague, Arpita Bedekar, who is Director of Strategy and Planning at Fintelec, and she will be speaking about uh, you know, global regulatory trends. After that, we will have a panel discussion where we will discuss the AML CFT priorities in the uh, region, uh, where we have Avnish Raman, Russell Wilson, and Devita Tupo, who will be joining us. Uh, but first, uh, let's start with the presentation by Arpita. Uh, before I invite her to start, let me say a few words about her so that you can get to know her better. Uh, so Arpita has more than 15 years of experience in planning, managing, and executing consulting and research projects in various verticals. Writing and editing have been part of this core experience, leading to several articles in both Indian and international publications to her credit. Uh, she has worked with organizations such as the Tata Group, Value Notes, and KPMG. She joined Fintelect uh, about almost 10 years back, uh, 2012, and is currently responsible for strategy and planning and is an integral part of the core leadership team. She holds a graduate degree in economics from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, which is in India and a master's degree in economic history from the London School of Economics and Political Sciences, UK. Uh, with that, Arpita, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Shirish. And good day to all the participants. Uh, Shirish, my screen is visible? Yes. Great. OK. It is indeed a privilege uh, to be speaking to AML professionals from the Pacific. Uh, as Shirish mentioned, Fintlect has been operating in AML CFT training and advisory for a couple of decades now. And based on our experience and understanding of this space, I'm going to spend the next few minutes providing a brief overview of global regulatory developments. But I think even before uh, you know, we start to look at uh, global trends, it is important to understand that for the last few years, there has been a lot of global dialogue around the success of the entire AML CFT regime and whether it has in fact achieved its objectives, which will be basically detecting and preventing money laundering and terrorist financing. Unfortunately, there are a few success stories and statistics of conviction or asset confiscation, if any, don't really paint a pretty picture. 
And every time there is a scandal like the Panama Papers or more recently the FinCEN file uh, leakage, there is a huge public outcry on what is really being done to protect the integrity of the global financial system. And this is something uh, that the Financial Action Task Force or the FATF, which is the international standard setting body also recognizes, which is obvious from the statement by its German president uh, that I have quoted here on the slide. And there is therefore considerable action visible on the ground towards improving effectiveness of the regulatory framework and equally to push the private sector into achieving what is not just tick box compliance to make regulators happy, but to really get to the root of identification and prevention of financial crime. So I do believe a lot of the regulatory updates and trends that I am about to present can be read from that perspective and within the context of this push towards effectiveness. So let me move on uh, to the trends. So it, it's really clear that dirty money flows not just through banks, although a large proportion of it may still be flowing through banks, but there are other sectors that are equally vulnerable. In the last few years, the AML CFT framework has been systematically expanded to include uh, DNFPBs, which are designated non-financial businesses and professions, to casinos, to real estate agents, to jewelry and gemstone dealers. So accordingly, the fifth AML directive by the European Union brings in high value art dealers into the fray. And similarly, the new AML Act in the US, which came into force on 1st of January this year, now includes arts and antiquities traders as reporting entities. But I think the most important inclusion among these certainly is around virtual assets and virtual asset service providers or the VASPs. It is an area of concern due to its pace of growth and the resultant you know, AML risks that are coming up. So in its latest plenary meeting in June 2021, the FATF noted that only 58 out of 128 reporting jurisdictions had so far implemented the FATF standards on VASP, and this includes implementing the much discussed travel rule. Among the countries that have already brought in regulation are the leading regulators in the US, EU, UK, Japan, in Asia Pacific, also Australia, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Taiwan where VASPs are mandated to register, to conduct KYC and due diligence of its customers like other reporting entities and to report suspicious transactions. On the other hand, many governments have either banned the use of virtual assets or they are sitting on the fence and have not introduced any regulations at all around virtual assets or VASPs. Even in the case of countries that have introduced some form of uh, legislation, the regulators are seeking comments and consultation from con uh, stakeholders continuously on how to build on that regulation and make it more comprehensive as this space evolves, especially to include newer areas now like stable coins or NFTs, which are non-fungible tokens. I find that an interesting, uh, a very forward-looking framework was introduced by the Monetary Authority of Singapore through its Payment Services Act in 2019 which was revised again last year in 2020. And that lays down a very clear taxonomy and an activity-based licensing system for payment service providers, including VASPs and digital payment tokens. And I'm sure many smaller country governments would be watching uh, the developments around the Payment Services Act uh, very closely. Coming to uh, the role of technology, there is now an endorsement by regulators that technology will play a critical role in improving the speed, quality, and efficiency of measures to combat uh, money laundering and terrorist financing. The FATF brought out a publication in July 2021 on the opportunities and challenges of new technologies for AML CFT, and it has highlighted a few areas like digital identity, transaction monitoring, uh, and analysis solutions, including collaborative analytics, as areas that can assist risk-based implementation of the FATF standards by the public and private sectors. And it will also help achieve the goal of financial inclusion, uh, which you know, many regulators, especially in developing countries, uh, are definitely looking at. So even before this acknowledgement uh, about the role of technology by uh, FATF, country regulators have been stressing on the use of technology solutions, uh, which will make AML compliance programs more efficient but of course, they're also, they have to be auditable and explainable at the same time. 
So sandboxes, they've been used as a good technique to drive responsible innovation and technological development that is in line with regulatory expectations. Again, countries in the APAC like Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, they have been at the forefront in the region uh, you know, on creating supporting environments uh, for technology development. And you know, if you look at the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, in fact, it has provided a huge boost to the use of digital identity and eKYC uh, around the world. During the pandemic also, various regulators provided updated guidelines on digital identification of customers, both individuals and uh, you know, corporates, and extended that from just banking to other sectors like money services businesses. There are some other countries like Bahrain, uh, the Nordics, uh, Netherlands, India, Abu Dhabi, uh, which are making progress towards the creation of eKYC utilities, which will hold centralized KYC information and will provide a single platform or a framework for enabling eKYC for financial services providers. And RegTech or regulatory technology is at the heart of such initiatives, which are improving efficiency as well as leading to cost savings uh, for financial institutions. Let me now move on to the identification of beneficial ownership. Uh, from the reporting entity point of view, the onus of identifying beneficial owners is on them. But the support system from the government in terms of publicly available data and ownership registers has been largely missing or not been very comprehensive. So again, in October 2019, the FATF published its best practices on beneficial ownership for legal persons. Uh, in that report, they recommended that information on beneficial ownership be available at a specified location in the country. And they you know, recommended one or more out of three ways. First is the registry approach, then the company approach and the existing information approach. And many countries now are acting upon the recommendations uh, from this report. So just to give you a few examples in the US, uh, which again had a lot of catch up to do on beneficial ownership regulation, the Corporate Transparency Act, which was part of the AML Act of 2020, it requires now certain legal entities to file beneficial ownership information with the FinCEN. And FinCEN, which is the regulatory authority in AML CFT, it has to maintain a non-public national corporate registry of that information. In the UK, uh, money laundering and terrorist financing amendment regulations 2019, which came into effect in, in 2020, uh, introduced a public registry of beneficial ownership information for corporate and legal entities. The fifth AMLD in the European Union, it also required all member states to set up a centralized and publicly accessible database containing uh, this information, beneficial ownership information. The problem again is implementation. Uh, despite the fifth AMLD guidelines, uh, many member states have either not established these registers or not made them publicly available. In a sense, making financial information more transparent and more easily available will definitely have an impact on exposing shell companies, on unearthing complicated ownership structures and routing of funds through offshore accounts. This is also very much in line with uh, efforts uh, to combat corruption, as many countries like the US, UK, Australia, they are looking at corruption now as a national security issue. Coming to risk assessments, uh, continuous risk assessments are critical in order to inform an appropriate risk-based approach, not just by reporting entities, but also by supervisors. Here again, the FATF's March 2021 guidance on risk-based supervision is an important document, which encourages countries uh, to move beyond a tick box approach uh, in monitoring the private sector's efforts to curb MLTF and to address the full spectrum of risks and focus resources where the risks are highest. There again, you know, there's some interesting initiatives uh, taken by leading regulators. The Monetary Authority of Singapore has published a thematic review of its inspections around enterprise-wide risk assessments, and it has identified a number of gaps. It has also recommended many best practices for institutional risk assessments. Austrac in Australia just released four reports assessing the MLTF risks facing four major banks, smaller domestic banks, foreign subsidiary banks, and foreign bank branches. So there's a, there's a need to go deeper and understand the risks better. The FinCEN uh, in the US has started an interesting initiative of publishing its AML strategic priorities, which along with the new AML Act will assist uh, reporting institutions in the US in their AML CFT efforts and enable them to prioritize the use of their compliance resources. 
And this, uh, the, the MLCFT strategic priorities, FinCEN expects to update uh, every four years. Coming to enforcements, now penalties levied in the US uh, used to be historically among the highest in the world, but that trend is changing in the last uh, you know, couple of years. Uh, data from Fenergo, which publishes uh, penalties, uh, it shows that in 2019, uh, penalties were highest in Europe. Uh, they were about 5.8 billion US dollars. And then in 2020, regulators in Asia Pacific actually levied the highest penalties uh, of somewhere around USD 5.1 billion amongst all the regions. So some of these numbers are a bit skewed because there are some very, very large penalties, uh, like in the case of Westpac Bank in, in Australia last year. But what it suggests clearly is that regulators outside the US are also now beginning to use enforcements you know, and penalties for serious non-compliance issues. On collaboration, you know, going back to the point I made at the beginning, governments are now looking to improve outcomes. And so far, the best results have been demonstrated through a collaborative effort amongst regulators, law enforcement bodies, and the private sector. Regulators are becoming more and more consultative even while drafting uh, you know, regulations and laws. Some examples are the consultation by OSTRAC on its AML-CTF reforms that came out this year, by Hong Kong on issues such as licensing of VASPs, and the other area, of course, is public-private partnerships for information sharing and some examples of PPPs that are already getting very good results, uh, we know, are from the UK, the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force in the Hong Kong, from the Fraud and Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force, and the New Zealand Financial Crime uh, Prevention Network. In this year, 2021, the five largest Dutch banks uh, got together in a unique partnership to form Transaction Monitoring Netherlands, or TMNL, which will work closely with Dutch financial regulators and law enforcement agencies. The combined entity that these five banks have put together, uh, they will eventually have other banks joining in. And if it yields the desired results, it will be a very, very significant step forward uh, in collaboration and something to watch for. Uh, for sure. So let me stop here. We have uh, an interesting panel to look forward to. So thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have uh, during the last 15 minutes, which we have allocated for the QA session. So thanks again. Uh, and it's over to you, Shrish. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Arpita, for that uh, presentation. Uh, we now move to the panel discussion. Uh, may I request the panelists to activate their audio and video, please? Great, excellent. Uh, so welcome Russell, uh, Tevita and Avnish to the panel discussion. Uh, before we start, uh, let me just say a few uh, introductory words about the three of you so that our audience uh, knows a bit of your background. Uh, let me start with Russell. So Russell Wilson has extensive experience in AML and CFT. He spent more than 10 years as the first general counsel at uh, Austrac, which is uh, Australia's financial intelligence and AML agency, uh, where he played a strategic role in preventing and detecting financial crime and money laundering in conjunction with major domestic and international financial organizations and regulators. He is currently special counsel at Maddox and also non-executive director at Transparency International Australia, and he is also an impanel trainer at Fintech Academy. Uh, our next panelist, uh, Tevita Tupo, is currently Program Management Officer with UNCTAD, that is the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Uh, he is also a consultant with IOM, that is the International Organization for Migration. Uh, he's a lecturer at USP Postgraduate Program on Border Security and a board member for the Indo-Pacific Counter Proliferation Initiative. Uh, Tevita spent more than 25 years with the Fiji Islands Revenue and Customs Authority uh, serving as National Manager of Risk and Compliance, and finally as General Manager of Customs, in which he was responsible for the overall leadership of all customs operations. Uh, our uh, third panelist, Avnish Raman, is very well known in the Pacific region and instrumental in arranging this webinar. Uh, so I'm sure most of you know him already. Uh, so he's known as a highly regarded international AML CFT consultant uh, who has worked in exceptionally high trust environments and was earlier also with the Fiji FIU. Uh, Avnish is a graduate and fellow of the Leadership Fiji program and was an active board member and director of the Leadership Fiji Management Board uh, from 2015 to 19. 
uh, Avnish now also represents Fintech Academy in the Pacific region. So, you know, we're very happy to have him there. So, as you can see, we have a, a very eminent panel today, and it is indeed an honor and privilege for me to uh, moderate this session. So, uh, to start with, uh, you know, uh, let's let's start with Avnish. So let's go in alphabetical order since Avnish starts with A. Uh, so, Avnish, uh, in your experience and opinion, you know, what would you say are some of the common challenges? faced by reporting entities in relation to adoption of the national risk assessments conducted by the Pacific Island countries uh, into their institutional risk assessments, you know, and what are some of the strategic implementation issues that you may like to suggest? Um, thank you, everyone. Um, Bula, everyone from Fiji. Um, thank you, Shirish, for the introductory remarks. Um, very happy to be part of the Fintelec team and to be part of this webinar as a panelist. Um, Thank you so much for that question. And it's a very valid, um, and I would say a very trending question, which I think most of the reporting entities were sort of struggling with, not only in the Pacific, not only in Fiji, but across the globe as well, in terms of uh, how do you implement national risk assessment findings into your institutional or internal risk assessments? It's a challenge globally and within the FATF membership as well as the APG membership, uh, Pacific Island countries, once um, they had gone across with their mutual evaluation um, uh, assessments, most of them have uh, sort of gone through the third round mutual evaluation. And um, I recall when I was with the Fiji FIU and we had uh, uh, done the national risk assessment uh, for Fiji and uh, we are trying to advocate for the financial institutions to sort of incorporate um, the key findings, the key crime types and the other findings in terms of the vulnerabilities that came out of the national risk assessment into the institutional risk assessments. And it was a big challenge because once one thing I would say is with the Pacific, um, most of the countries that have undergone the mutual evaluations have produced a sort of a, a very um, condensed version of the national risk assessment. They have produced different versions, some of them, uh, but what's available in the public domain is perhaps not to that level that they would want to, because they would want to go beyond um, being able to see where the statistics came from. Because um, I think, we may have lost a niche. Uh, Most on the lines of guesstimates. Okay. And then again, the, the major challenge is also that how continue, I mean, do, do, uh, do the countries update their national risk assessments on a continual basis? And then how much of this is advocated to the financial institutions on a real time basis? So there's always that um, sort of a, I would say disconnect somewhere that in terms of um, the continuous uh, dialogue that needs to sort of happen. And especially during the times of pandemic when risk have changed, I would say globally. In security, perhaps health has become the biggest risk, uh, risk across the Pacific. And efforts have been diverted by law enforcement, by the financial institutions. Some of them are basically just surviving right now to meet ends. And then you have to weigh the cost of uh, conducting their normal businesses and trying to generate a profit versus the cost of compliance. So all of these are sort of the factors that financial institutions are grappling with right now in terms of being able to, first of all, incorporate those national risk assessment findings into the institutional risk assessment. And secondly, being able to continuously update and keep on terms of the trends, what is happening right now, and how do they keep updating so that they're on par with uh, what's happening in the global regulatory environment in the Pacific context in terms of the national security environment, as well as other factors that may have um, impact on uh, their risk assessment. So that's my initial take on that. Thanks, uh, thanks Avnish. Uh, Tevita, would you like to comment on that question as well? And after that, I will uh, go to Russell. Uh, thank you, Shirish. And uh, let me at the offset just uh, thank all, thank Avnish for the, thank all of you for the opportunity for me to be here. I uh, also acknowledge our distinguished panelists that are here with us. And of course the participant. Uh, I come from a law enforcement uh, background, a bit of taxation, and uh, 
also with the human trafficking and, and maybe if I'm to just provide perspective around some of the things that I do around the Pacific in the last uh, four or five years. Uh, you know, one of the, the biggest vulnerability that the Pacific has is the fact it's, it, it's uh, one, it's, it's, unbanked, it's, it's an unbanked economy. Um, it's predominantly cash based. Uh, and, and this, you know, for when you talk about drugs, you talk about human trafficking, you talk about the different crime types that happens in the Pacific. The, the Pacific has become a, um, you know, an, an, just a, the, the development gaps around, you know, what uh, Avnesh was saying. This just, uh, it puts criminals on, uh, they see the Pacific as, as, a, as an oasis of, of funneling funds, illicit funds. And then let, let, me, let me again say this in perspective. You've got uh, Tuvalu, Kiribati, and um, Nauru that use Australian dollars. You've got uh, friends up in the north, uh, uh, the Micronesian, uh, Palau, uh, FSM, uh, most of them, they, they all use the US dollars. And you've got Nauru, uh, you've got uh, Kukal and Inuit that uh, use uh, New Zealand dollars. You know, this in itself, you know, with, with the uh, development gaps in terms of policy gaps, in terms of capability that is very low. Uh, you know, the, you're looking at, uh, for me, given the experience, and I, I say, you know, I say this with a lot of caution, you know, because there's a lot of money to be made, uh, you know, using professional enablers, I call them professional enablers to funnel funds around systems that are, you know, that are rudimentary, so to speak, you know, are rudimentary, that still are very, it's basic and, it, you know, maybe Russell will probably pick up some of these things because, you know, the, from a law enforcement perspective, you always say this, is the need to know and need to share. These criminals know this, they know this. You know, and they and they they play around with with the strengths, mostly the weaknesses of of, of law enforcement, and uh, and, and this, this this has been happening for some time. You know, and uh, uh, the issue is how do you narrow the development gaps? You know, how do you address them not only nationally but you know coordinated regionally for the Pacific, and and, and it requires a, a lot of effort, not only for uh, all border agencies, but you know for. Um, for issues that are happening across the, the financial system in the Pacific, you know, there's, uh, it can't be seen in isolation. It needs to be seen holistic. Uh, you know, while the Pacific is small, uh, it, it has become a, you know, a, an oasis for criminals to, to funnel funds. Uh, in, 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 you know, like, I wish I could have the time to tell you some of the stories of the things that you've seen. Yeah? Okay, you've seen, uh, you know, Camaro running in Kiribati, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, some of these uh, high valuable goods that are in countries that are not supposed to be there, you know, and uh, these, these are just uh, indicators of, of things that are happening. And this, you, know, you have a range of these things happening. Uh, and, and for me, if, if I just leave it at that, it, it again highlights the need, uh, you know, because from law enforcement, they, they only see drugs. It's, it, it's the economics that drives the crime that needs to be viewed in totality. That, that's, you know, if I leave it at that, then and maybe we'll, we'll progress. With that Thank, Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks, Tavita. Uh, Rasen, if I may pose that same question to you um, and get your uh, inputs on that. Sure. Um, and it's, thank you for having me and welcome to everyone. Um, it's very interesting listening to the comments of us, Avinash and Tavita. Um, if I may just add to them with a few things. I'm unfortunately speaking from a country that has not conducted a national risk assessment and has sought to appease FATF by doing what it calls sectoral risk assessments, um, of which Pete, I mentioned a few um, in her earlier presentation. Um, to me, that is a huge failing in terms of how Australia handles and CTF issues at the moment, the absence of a national risk assessment. If there was a national risk assessment, then it should really set the tone and almost provide a checklist for um, both private and public organisations within the country and who operate in the country uh, to set their own uh, risk assessments uh, and to see what uh, the government of the country, I guess, regards as the, the major issues confronting it uh, and then put that into play in terms of its own particular risk assessments for its own products and services. So that really is necessary to assist the organisations that operate within the country. Um, there are a couple of other comments made as well in regard to sharing of information, and uh, Peter mentioned it in collaboration. Um, 
I think there is far more sharing of information between law enforcement agencies, FIUs and related organisations around the world. Uh, Australia, of course, um, the Pacific is its neighbourhood uh, and it likes to collaborate with all the nations in this area, as well as wider afield. And it has, um, Austrac has, I know, a lot of um, what it calls memorandum of understanding with uh, equivalents in countries in the region and more wider afield in order to be able to collaborate, provide intelligence, financial intelligence, uh, and also assist with a range of other inquiries. It's got separate means for mutual legal assistance, of course, for, for criminal matters under federal legislation. And the other point I'd like to make is in regard to, I guess, um, helping um, the, the less sophisticated nations, particularly in the Pacific neighbourhood, to deal with these issues. Given that these are transnational issues uh, and we're only as good as fighting it as the weakest link in the chain. Um, the chain has got to be strong globally for it to operate effectively. Uh, I know that Austrac and Australia tries to do its part by providing both technical assistance and also training as well in regard to uh, issues to do with AML CDF and related matters. So I think, I think if anything, there is a, um, a, a, an increased focus on that, particularly given the pandemic situation. And I think increased assistance, and I know the recent changes to the AML CDF, we call it CDF in Australia, we have to do things differently, of course, but anyway, <laughs> uh, not CFT, um, uh, has been on, for example, you know, enabling greater sharing of information by the Australian government and Austrac with other governments in regard to these kinds of issues. So these are all good trends, uh, and I think they're continuing, and I think in part as well, the timing is good because they're increasingly needed to cope with the greater risks and different risks that have been brought forward by the pandemic. Right. Okay. So um, let's uh, speak now about some of the, uh, you know, uh, trends or typologies. And after that, let's move on to, um, you know, how monitoring or detection uh, is happening, uh, especially, you know, before and after the pandemic. You know, nowadays we can't have any panel discussion unless we speak about uh, pre-COVID uh, pre and post-COVID, although I'm not sure whether we are still in post-COVID or we are currently in COVID, it changes for every country. Uh, so, uh, you know, what are some of the common uh, trends or typologies that you have observed in this region, in the Pacific region, uh, you know, uh, during the pandemic period, what has changed? Uh, maybe Tavita or uh, Avnish, any one of you would like to take that first? Um, I'll probably hand it over to Tavita because he might be able to share from a law enforcement perspective and I can um, provide further input. So Tavita, over to you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> you know, to, you know, go back to what I said earlier, you know, for those of you that have uh, Operation Ironside with, with uh, what the Australian Federal Police just had recently, um, one of the things that came out of that is that and then and, and Russell mentioned this, is that 65% uh, of crime that happens in Australia has an international dimension to it. You know, everything that happens now is transnational. Uh, and, you know, rightfully, Russell said that we are only as strong as our weakest link. You know, the Pacific becomes the most vulnerable link right now in terms of policy, in terms of capability, uh, cash-based economy, with less, uh, you know, unbanked economy. It, it is just... Uh, in a lot of ways, it attracts a lot of, um, you know, a lot of these um, criminals to, 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 to move funds around. Eh? And then, you know, again, if I, if I go back, it, it highlights the level of uh, how dynamic organized crime is. You spoke about post-COVID. Eh? Uh, in a given example, in, uh, in 2020, when all the borders were closed uh, in Australia, and Russell, you probably would know this, 32 tons of cocaine was seized at the border, even when all borders are closed. So this goes to show the level of how, how fluid and how dynamic organized crime is, you know. Uh, and then to provide perspective, the economics of it is this, you know, one kilo of cocaine in, in, in Colombia is, is about four or five thousand US. Hits the Australian market, it's about uh, almost 200,000 or 180, depending. 
you know, the, even if law enforcement, which by a long shot will, will get say 80% of comes in, because law enforcement only gets about one or 2%, they still make a profit. This is what drives them to understand. And if this is what drives them, they will continue to throw this at us. But we need, also need, to, and that's why I keep going back to the coordination. Uh, to, the Pacific, you know, the, the transit point is the Pacific. Okay, physically drugs and other things move across, but it's, it's the funds that, uh, that moves through this uh, very, how would you say, uh, rudimentary um, uh, financial system that's in the Pacific, that, you know, those that have Australian dollars, that have uh, New Zealand dollars and the US dollars up in the French, you know, it, if we can coordinate efforts around this, FinCEN is up and most Austrac is down here, you know, you've got New Zealand, you've got, you know, every, every big, big place are, are all centered around here. In my view, it's how do we coordinate these efforts? How do we bring it all together, you know? And it, I tell you something, law enforcement will struggle when it comes to things like this. And you know, law enforcement is very territorial when it comes to it. But I think we really need to see the bigger picture. Here. You know, if, if COVID has taught us something, uh, you know, it, it's about coming together. You know, we, um, it, it's, it's seeing the outcome because, you know, we, we say this always when it comes to drugs and human trafficking. This is the battle of our generation. If we lose this, there's no coming back. You know, and, and I think you know that 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 should that is something that should drive us. And from a Pacific perspective, you know, we are we are the receiving end of things. From a trade perspective, the, the Pacific is not the price setter; it's the price getter. It doesn't have the 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 capability to set price for goods. It just gets it, and that was, that's why we're a dumping ground for all types of goods and things that happen around here. So it, it needs a whole lot more than what's happening, you know, and I say this with a lot of respect, Australia New Zealand has done a lot, but I think there's still a lot more that we can do. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably leave it at that. Thanks, Anish, you wanna go? Huh? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Tavita, for providing that context. And I was going to add on to the sort of the drugs uh, uh, network, uh, so Operation um, uh, Iron Shield, um, that was recently trending, there was a, good collaboration amongst law enforcement and private sector financial institutions and all other players in the AML CFT framework uh, to make that operation so successful. And there were other different chapters of it. And uh, in New Zealand and Australia, our neighboring uh, jurisdictions were very much instrumental um, on that particular operation. But in the Pacific, and I had done a presentation earlier at the Fintelec um, uh, virtual summit that we had on pandemic precursors in the Pacific. and. Uh, I cannot stress and emphasize that the modus of Randy has sort of evolved during the pandemic in particular, the drug routes, the way um, uh, this cocaine washes up in practically all the Pacific Island countries. We had it in Fiji last year, we had it in Tonga, we had it in um, Marshall Islands. So there, there's been this trending sort of cocaine washes up in the Pacific. And uh, even in Fiji, there's a documentary up on YouTube, um, in particular that the cocaine washes were from Mexican cartels um, from Colombia. And so therefore the drug routes have changed and therefore the law enforcement and the private sector financial institutions need to continuously have the dialogue. So no one can walk in isolation during these times. There needs to be continuously, um, the financial institutions need to be aware of the trends, what is trending out there, um, and then be able to um, look at global typologies, but be able to link it to the Pacific. So uh, the Fiji FIU in particular, I would say, has been doing press releases around the uh, pandemic fraud, where people were impersonating themselves in terms of, uh, you know, uh, being pretending to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, purchase equip, uh, PPE equipment. Uh, and then there was other sort of similar cases that have been also referred to in the Pacific as well. Um, there's also been a very much focus as Arpita mentioned on the global trends and Pacific has not been spared uh, in terms of virtual assets. So over here, I'd be very careful in terms of my approach as to how I would say that introduction of virtual assets and VASPs VESPs would be, it has to be done in a very uniform way. So again, I want to emphasize to both the law enforcement as well as the private sector and other stakeholders that we need to have a very uniform approach to the risk, context and materiality, the three factors, when we are looking at risk assessments as well as in terms of implementation. Because whilst we may think that it is very 
like everything about virtual assets may be, um, we may be brainwashed to say that it is bad, but there's obviously advantages to it in terms of the financial inclusion umbrella and the use of new technologies whereby you can leverage onto that and be able to. So there is that sort of a debate between the um, regulating them as well as prohibiting them. While some jurisdictions have taken that sort of approach that we will prohibit and we will not be able to wanting to regulate this in particular, and we just don't want to have it in the country, but you are opening yourselves to extra regulation because then there could be enhanced monitoring. So you must be able to prove that um, there is activity happening and uh, you know you must have countermeasures already in place so in terms of uh, implementation the pacific is still i would say struggling a bit in terms of capability and capacity to implement this but obviously it's trending and we will need to keep up with the trends and so that's my take on that thank you uh, thanks avnish so uh, russell uh, you know tevita and avnish have covered you know uh, the drug trade human trafficking uh, you know virtual assets uh, they're seeing uh, you know, risks around that. Uh, I think also what has come out is uh, maybe a slightly, uh, they painted a slightly bleak picture of uh, the preparedness of uh, the Pacific Islands when it comes to uh, not being used as a uh, conduit uh, for uh, illicit uh, flows of money. Uh, sitting in Australia and, you know, also knowing uh, about that region, what is your take on this? I mean, uh, first, uh, do you have a similar view? Uh, are there any other risks also that, uh, or typologies or trends you feel uh, you would like to add? Well, uh, if you believe uh, some authors, um, in Australia, I'm living in the most attractive place for dirty money in the region. Um, from, uh, you know, real estate to, um, I don't know what you might, uh, a whole host of different things. Um, there have been allegations of lost of investment, of dirty money from the region and elsewhere, primarily in real estate, but also in other things in Australia as well. Um, I would say that um, in terms of typologies, um, the pandemic has um, shown an increase in typologies associated with the money, the lots of money that government has given out to help people through this situation. A couple of examples are in regard to the receipt of the money. Uh, there have been um, uh, there's, there have been lots of cases of uh, identification, falsification and theft of identity in order to receive government money. There have also been lots of cases of uh, people posing as government to provide money to people and thereby ascertaining their, their bank account details, etc., in order to be able to defraud them. So all of these are, I think, um, increased means, they're probably not new, but you know, increased means of obtaining illicit funds which are then bonded. There have also been, uh, as I'm sure elsewhere, cases of, um, uh, uh, of, of deceptive sale of um, medical goods and services to raise money as well, where either such um, goods are substandard or simply don't exist, and similarly in regard to the services. It's um, interesting to hear some of what's happening in the Pacific region and it being largely a cash-based economy because uh, I guess the current situation has created a problem where you not only can't move people, but you can't move cash um, if, if that's what the, way, the way you were going to do things. So to me, that must mean that there is an increase in um, electronic funds transfers and probably in digital currencies. Now, Australia, as for some other countries, has moved to regulate their digital currencies by having a digital currency exchange, but it goes nowhere near far enough. It doesn't, for example, control the platform uh, on which the digital currencies are traded, uh, which, of course, could well be outside Australia's jurisdiction anyway. It would just be hosted on a server somewhere off, maybe somewhere in, somewhere in a Pacific country. <laughs> so, you know, these are, these are some of the issues that need to be grappled with. Um, interestingly, uh, it's gone very quiet in regard to the digital currency that Facebook put forward. I think it was called Libra. Um, and Facebook at that time, I think maybe it's now a couple of years old at least, said that it would work with regulators around the world in order to make sure it satisfied all of the regulatory requirements in each jurisdiction before it implemented it. And I know it's, it's talked to Austrac in Australia. Um, 
So that's a, that was a very good indication because can you imagine, I don't know how many millions of Facebook followers there are in the world. I'm actually not on Facebook, but, you know, there are millions and millions. Um, if at least, you know, a portion of them took out a digital wallet, wallet Libra, and in which there were digital currencies, and this will be a stable coin based on a basket of the world's major currencies. So it'll be fairly reliable, probably far more reliable than Bitcoin. Um, it actually gave the opportunity for a global standard to be established by Facebook in regard to customer identification and verification for the purposes of trading in digital currencies. So there was a, an interesting situation, or is still an interesting situation, of a major global player wanting to introduce a digital currency, which might actually permit regulators around the world to work with it to establish a secure means of conducting digital currency exchanges, which would have been a very interesting proposition, but I haven't heard much on this for quite a while. It seems to have gone cold. Maybe it's in the too hard basket. Um, anyway, those are just some brief comments from me. Um, right. So let's speak a bit about the uh, monitoring or detection side. I mean, I know, uh, you know, uh, all three of you are from the uh, regulatory or uh, enforcement side, but uh, in your interaction with uh, banks, uh, other reporting entities, do you think, uh, or maybe, you know, uh, where you're seeing some of the reports which are coming in, do you think uh, that the framework for monitoring or detection, uh, has that changed or evolved uh, after the pandemic? Have uh, banks made an effort? Uh, what are you seeing on the ground? Um, Avnish, uh, or Russell, do you want to comment on that first? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, in, 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 in Australia and, and from what I've seen, um, there, um, I, I guess it's a tough situation. There is sought to be a balance achieved between complying with the AML CDF requirements, um, customer identification and verification, KYC, all the usual stuff. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the banks have needed to adapt to continue to do business, for example, as of other financial and other institutions. So it's a bit of a balancing act. Um, I don't think a lot has changed, frankly. Uh, I think obviously there have been um, procedures and processes needing to be put in place to replace face-to-face -face contact that's obviously needed to have happened and that has been happened by virtual means uh, which the technology is generally available um, there are there are perhaps increases in suspicious matter reporting uh, in some areas but that could be as a more as a precaution by the reporting entity so a kind of a defensive reporting if you like uh, to some extent as well um, the recent cases in Australia, I, I know a lot of it, the big cases that people have heard of, uh, you know, are largely based on historical grounds, but there doesn't seem to be a decrease in risk taking by some organisations, um, particularly the big organisations. Um, uh, I think we'll get to this a bit later, but it's, you know, the issue of, uh, of um, just considering what the, the, what the cost of doing business might be in terms of completely complying, you know, with the regulatory requirements that, that you are supposed to, supposed to be putting into effect. So I'm not sure that there's been a dramatic change in behaviour in regard to the pandemic situation. Uh, I think there's been an adaption uh, to cope with the lack of face-to-face -face contact, which was necessary in order to do business. But I'm not convinced that, um, you know, that a, a, a lot has changed, frankly. Right. Uh, Avnish and Tevita, what are your views on that? Do you echo the same views or uh, is it something different that you're seeing? Um, if I may go first. Uh, so what I have noticed from my interactions, especially in dialogue with some of the private sector financial institutions as to how they have been coping uh, post-pandemic, 
I would say that there has been more interaction between different lines of business. So, because previously in an office setting, uh, maybe uh, people have resorted more to working from home in Fiji, for example, for four to five months, people have been working from home. So when I have been interacting with them, I have noticed that there has been a greater collaboration amongst other business units in terms of information trickling across the organization, much more in terms of compliance and proactive measures, especially um, sharing of trends, indicators, um, and guidance documents. So FETF has also been producing sort of a lot of guidance documents. There has been a lot of other webinars that uh, has been accessible, I would say, that may have been maybe restricted before. So a lot of information has been made available in the public domain on financial crime compliance and similar issues as well. So I guess the information and knowledge sharing has increased more widely across the organization, not only AML compliance units, perhaps um, uh, working in isolation. So that would be my take on this. Right. So you believe because the information sharing has increased, actually, that could have led to a better quality of monitoring and uh, uh, reporting, right? Abhish? Sorry, my video broke for a moment. Um, could you repeat that again, Shirish? So, so I was saying that uh, because the uh, information sharing has gone up now, uh, because of so much, so much going online uh, and so much information available, uh, do you think that has led to actually uh, more effectiveness, uh, better reporting, quality of reporting happening within institutions because they understand issues much better? Abhish? Okay, we'll come back to Abhish. Uh, I think he's having a connection problem. Uh, Tevita, do you want to comment on the monitoring side? Maybe not so much the monitoring side. Is it okay if I say something around the, the partnership between law enforcement and the private sector? Is it okay if I... Yes, know, absolutely. Just, so in fact, that was going to be my next point, you know, that, okay. uh, you know, what, uh, you know, uh, what are you seeing in terms of, uh, you know, Pacific uh, region demonstrating uh, PPPs? Uh, do you think there are in, uh, impediments? Uh, are you seeing any uh, signs of uh, that working out? So it'll be great if you can comment on that. Thank you. And I see this as, a, you know, if, if there's something that needs to be strengthened, it's really the, the partnership between uh, the private sector and law enforcement. Um, I, I tell you, uh, they've always been at loggerhead. Law enforcement have no idea the information that sits with private sector. Uh, you know, we, we, we usually joke about this, that uh, it's always the information that the private sector brings to law enforcement. Law enforcement sensitizes it. And then, you know, all of a sudden they said, we can't share this with you. And it's the information that emanates from them. You know? <laughs> but, you know, if, 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 they, if there's a, an awareness that to, to, to say, look, we're in this together. Uh, you know, what you want and what you want is, is for the same thing. And I think, you know, to simply put it, 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 it requires a shift in thinking. Uh, that, you know, and I, I continue to go back to the pandemic, you know, the pandemic has really leveled us to say that you and I are on the same boat, you know, law enforcement and um, the private sector both want the same thing. We just have a funny way of saying it to each other. And I think that communication really needs to happen. Uh, uh, you know, if you have to disrupt organized crime, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where, you know, the discussion needs to happen. Uh, and, and in my view, and even with, with the, the experience that we've had, uh, total disruption, you know, we, we can't eradicate this. But, you know, if, if we have to start and start well, you know, we can have the best legislation, we can have the, the most capable, competent people and all these things. And like what uh, Russell said, you're only strong as you kill weakling, but you have, if you have a corrupt private, private sector, Nothing will ever happen, you know. The, uh, they'll they'll be the enabler that uh, that becomes the weak link. And, and another thing that I'd also like to push in is that um, the professional enablers, accountants and lawyers. You know, I'm not saying that they are bad. You know, all I'm saying is, you know, these guys are uh, they they are good to have on your side. They are very bad not to have them on your side. You know, and then you know, this is this is how you you are able to 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 work with them because, you know, in bigger countries, the professional enablers, you know. The, 
organize crime, pay them to, you know, to, to funnel funds, to you know, do all kinds of, they, they find legal gaps, they find all kinds of regulatory loopholes for them to funnel funds across. So they know it, they know that inside out. They didn't even make submission to government on you know, what to change, what not to change. So you know, this, is, this is where, uh, you know, and I'm speaking very broadly here, uh, this is where some of the things that needs to be tightened up. Eh? Right, Avnish, what's your uh, take on uh, public-private partnerships uh, in the Pacific? Uh, I think Arpita covered some of it in her presentation uh, on some other cases that are happening in other parts of the world. But uh, what is happening uh, in the Pacific Islands specifically? Um, thank you, Shirish. So for the public-private partnerships, I cannot emphasize um, the need as to why it is much more important, which Devita also said, that um, it's much more time that uh, the doors start to open and the trust starts to build, especially right now where we are not operating in a physical environment, most in a virtual environment, and the detection is has to be much more robust and much more proactive than ever before. And the, the information needs to flow through in a more timely basis to the FIUs in particular, who sort of act as the medium in terms of um, linking up with the law enforcement. Because law enforcement priorities have been diverted right now. Uh, in particular, we know that a few operations over here have um, maybe stalled because of uh, you know response efforts being driven towards COVID. And at the same time, the judiciary is struggling as well because the courts have been closed for quite a while in some countries. And therefore the cases are not being able to um, you know, expedite as we would have liked it to before. So this sort of the criminal mindset would be that, oh, maybe the cases are not going towards court. So this may give them the leeway that perhaps the law enforcement and the detection authorities are not doing their job or perhaps uh, they would find it much more vulnerable, like, you know, much more in terms of scheming and being able to uh, expedite their acts. So this is, I think, more that we need this partnership, the public-private partnership, the openness to data, the openness to information and trust that needs to be created more so than ever before. And also over here, I'd like to um, add on to something else, which is very important, which I know the FIUs in the region are doing right now, is they're using more so of a financial intelligence led disruption, which is very much, I think, the aim of looking at proceeds of crime right now from a private sector financial institution, as well in terms of being able to supply that in, uh, information to the FIU to convert that into intelligence and being able to supply it to the law enforcement chain so that the cases that are being brought to the surface right now are being able to be expedited in terms of investigation and leading up to prosecution so there could be a much more timely, I would say, results and outcomes. Right. Uh, so Russell, what's your view on PPPs? I mean, you know, everybody's talking about it, uh, uh, but, you know, there's, there's also a school of thought which says that, you know, if people want to say they're doing something about AML and CFT, let's talk about PPPs. And, you know, it's become almost like a fashionable thing to do, whether or not anything is happening on the ground. Uh, what is your view on this? And uh, what are you seeing that is happening uh, in the Pacific Island region? Well, I, I would hope that there is general recognition now that not one single party can fix the problem of money laundering or terrorism financing for that matter. Not the regulator, not the government, not law enforcement, not major financial institutions, not any others that you get to name. There has to be a collaboration. And this is part of the, the weakest link, um, I guess, description. Um, it has to be a tightly forged link, both domestically as well as internationally. So I think there is great scope for public-private partnerships to fight this evil. Uh, and in Australia, Austrac has what's called the Fintel Alliance. So that's a collaboration of the major banks, tax office, law enforcement, and so on. And it's open to membership by other parties as well. That's been quite effective, particularly in highlighting the emerging risks from the pandemic uh, and in dealing with all sorts of other issues in terms of criminal activity, fraud activity, scams, the whole range of issues. Um, that uh, I guess, I guess uh, create the, uh, the illicit funds uh, and then the laundering of those funds. One of the issues though that, um, that needs to be grappled with in jurisdictions, and it's certainly the case in Australia, 
is that for these partnerships to work very effectively, and this is the complaint largely from the private sector, is that we need, um, they need, um, uh, they need uh, verified data to deal with. Um, for example, um, the companies and securities register in Australia comprises completely of unverified data. Anybody can put anything up there. It's not verified, can't be relied upon. It would be far more effective for everyone if there was a verified data set. There is no um, register of beneficial ownership in Australia of companies or any other legal entities for that matter. Uh, if these things were to exist and there'd be sources of reliable data that private sector could depend upon and uh, could help that partnership work a lot better as well as tackling the evils that we are all talking about today. Uh, of course, that requires investment, probably by government, um, and also government accepting some of the risks associated with the verification of that data. So uh, these are issues which are still being debated in Australia, probably in other countries who have even, which have even less resources than Australia has. Right. So, uh, Russell, in your uh, interaction with banks or other reporting entities, I mean, uh, do you think, uh, you know, there is sufficient guidance from regulators on AMLCF? Do you think uh, more guidance needs to be given to reporting entities? Uh, you know, have, have you seen any change happening, uh, you know, since the last year and a half? I, I, think, I think there needs to be guidance when situations change dramatically and risks change or increase, such as in the pandemic situation. And I think that's happened. Um, so, and I think that's been welcomed. Uh, and that, that could be an example of collaboration as well in order to be able to achieve that. And I think that has happened to a large extent. People have put aside their own company or government interests or whatever they might be in terms of the common interest and in seeking to fulfill the common interest. Um, you have to balance that, of course, with the fact that, frankly, there's a deluge of guidance available out there. Uh, and I would think from the point of view of some reporting entities, it becomes a problem to make sense out of the, all the guidance that's available. Austrac has, to its benefit, come out with some really targeted guidance that's been very helpful. And a couple of examples of that that I can think of are in regard to um, money transfer businesses, um, which I think is the general name that it's known around the world, slightly different terminology in Australia, but I think you know what I mean, and also digital currency exchanges. So it can deliver, uh, regulators can deliver very targeted guidance when they want to, and that's very helpful because it's based on their intelligence reserves and what they see from the reporting and what they see from partner agencies such as law enforcement and national security that work with them. So that can be very effective when it comes. Um, and there's probably not as much of that as there perhaps should be. Um, but I think the, the important role for the regulator in the current climate is to try to keep abreast of developments uh, in terms of illegal activity and risks uh, and provide that guidance to the population, particularly its regulated population as quickly as possible. Right. Avnish, are you seeing uh, similar things happening uh, in Fiji and uh, the other Pacific Islands? I mean, have, have there been more regulations or let's say more prescri prescriptive guidelines which have been coming out? So um, in relation to guidance, which is obviously um, most of the regulators, uh, as well as the uh, policy setting bodies such as FATF um, and then APG have been producing sort of guidance around this Austrac as well. But at the end of the day, when the Pacific uh, sort of, I, from my own opinion, I would say needs to create sort of a guidance from the Pacific perspective themselves so that they'll be able to understand some of this better because uh, most of the times, we in the Pacific struggle with the risk, context, and materiality, these three factors. Because the argument is that some things that are applying globally are perhaps not um, maybe the risk assessments are showing us a different perspective and then the implementation tells us to do this. And because it's globally, and maybe there is sometimes not that, there's a negligible risk I would say, but because you have to implement it 
due to the standards, then where do you find that balance? So therefore this guidance needs to be taken into a perspective whereby you are meeting the criteria and the standards in terms of international AML CFT compliance, but at the same time, you are producing something which is very much implementable and relatable, I would say. So you don't go over and beyond in terms of implementing the standards, but where do you come to a point whereby you are able to have a fine balance that, okay, you have done so, so and so measures in terms of legislative amendments, in terms of policy, but it has to work at an institutional level. So I think that's where sort of there needs to be more dialogue within the Pacific for different stakeholders. I'm not just saying for the reporting entities, they all have different uh, forums. So like the Pacific Island FIUs have their own forum. Um, there's, um, you know, the uh, supervisors have their own sort of forum. There's a Pacific remittance project going on at the same time. So there's this sort of dialogues happening within different uh, sectors as well as different sort of institutions. Uh, but again, yes, I would say that we can so rely on international guidance, Interpol and others, you know, have produced so much of guidance as well, especially apart, I mean, following the pandemic. But at the end of the day, when you are sort of advocating to your staff members or at an institutional level, be very mindful that whatever is internationally needs to work within your institution, as well as in the national context as well. Yeah. Right. So, Abhish, uh, uh, you know, what is your take on, let's say, the cost of compliance versus business as, business as usual approach? I mean, uh, you know, do you see uh, banks and reporting entities keen on investing more on, uh, you know, measures such as new software, uh, more training, uh, you know, versus focusing on just generating revenue or profits? I mean, do you see them uh, trying to adopt a better balance uh, in, in that region? What is your view on that? And maybe I'll go to Tevita afterwards for that as well. So I don't have the insider information on what the banks or other institutions are implementing at this moment. But I would say that there's a lot of software solutions out in the market right now with EKYC um, sort of, you know, a trend moving towards that in terms of onboarding clients within minutes. So the, these are some of the solutions that could uh, perhaps be of benefit whilst most of, um, you know, staff members are sort of working from home. And that could be like, you know, some of the software solutions that they could implement. But at the same time, I would say I cannot emphasize highly on training the staff because you could have the best of softwares implemented, you could have the best of systems. But during this time, when there's a bit of a downtime, I would say, I think uh, the corporate uh, bodies should start to uh, roll out more training and more sort of awareness. This is where everyone has to be upskilled so that you are aware of what's trending globally as well as in the Pacific context. So without that particular knowledge, you would not be able to detect screen or be able to be as proactive as you would. So if I may say that if you had a software solution where you had politically exposed person database, you had all the access to sanctions, but if you did not know what's the uh, international standards around this and to where you need to monitor and what exactly do you need to look out for based on the current trends and typologies, perhaps the system is in front of you, but you're not making the full use of it. So I cannot emphasize enough the need for training and upskilling of staff so that you and also reading and being able to uh, be across what the trend, what's trending right now and where you can leverage on that to be able to comply to the best of your knowledge. Devita, what's your view? Are banks doing enough in terms of uh, investments to, to comply? Thank you. Uh, is it okay if I throw in the spin ball? I'll, I'll always bring in the law enforcement side of things. Eh? Um, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have a clue as to what the, you know the cost of compliance and all those things that are happening. But one of, one of the things that I've uh, I've seen over the years is that you know it's the incentives that the government put in. And I'll use Fiji's example. Fiji dropped its corporate tax from thirty two to eighteen percent. ANZ shifted its uh, regional office to Fiji. That's an incentive, yeah? Because they don't want to pay 32% copper tax in Australia. They move that across here. If I'm a criminal, you know, I've got a partner there, I can do that easy. So my point is this, you know, yes, we would like to regulate. We would like to regulate this and all of this. 
If you look at the 2021 Pacta report of uh, EU, 80% of criminals now use legitimate business structures to clean their funds. You know, as much as we would like to regulate, you know, as much as we would like to do all of these things, you know, we, we need to strike that balance. And that's why private sector law enforcement, the effort has to be coordinated. And I, I come back to the Pacific because the Pacific is very small, you know, still very rudimentary. You know, if we can, you know, model something that, that works, you know, it might not be the model in Australia or the bigger country. You've got to scale it, you've got to contextualize it, you've got to know the, con the capability that's on the ground and you grow it over time, you know? Uh, because if not, you know, come 10 years, we'll be talking about the same thing. So I thought, hope, hope that makes sense in some way. <sighs> yes, yes, Tavita, thanks. So uh, there was one more point which, uh, you know, I wanted to speak about before we move it to audience questions. Um, now, we all know that, you know, there is a need for continuous training on AM and CFT. I don't think anybody uh, contests that. Uh, and also that, you know, in the absence of face-to-face -face these days, virtual has become uh, very, very regular. Uh, we also know that, yes, banks and reporting entities have to uh, do training for board of directors, for compliance teams, for heads of departments, for frontline staff. But what do you think are the training gaps uh, in regulatory organizations or law enforcement departments so that, you know, they can be better prepared uh, to regulate and supervise? Um, Russell, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, I've actually seen this in operation to some extent in Australia because I had the benefit of um, spending a week uh, working in the Westpac Bank um, and seeing how they dealt with things from the development of new products and assessing the risks associated with those, the regulatory risks associated with those products right through to things, you know, the products and services that they're offering at the moment. Um, so I think it's beneficial for regulators to continue to have training in terms of not just the issues that go to feed typologies, but also in the issues faced by the reporting entities which they regulate. Now, they can't possibly deal with all the reporting entities, but I know Austrac certainly has relationship with, with a major financial institution that it can draw on. Uh, and probably in other sectors as well, such as money transfer businesses or remittance you know, service providers and so on. So I think that is a good type of public-private partnership to have. And I think you can do that the other way as well. You can have people, as has happened in Australia, from private organisations working in with the regulator. Uh, of course, you need to take certain safeguards in regard to their access to data and personal information. For obvious reasons, as does the private organisations when you go and work there or spend time with them. But I think that's a good way of continual training for the regulator so that it understands what the real world risks and issues are. Right. Um, uh, Tevita, do you have any uh, comment on this? You know, what sort of training is required for regulators or law enforcement, uh, you know, to make them more effective. I think, uh, you know, in addition to what Russell said, I think cross training, you know, uh, and, and, and awareness and appreciation of what uh, other agencies do, uh, just creating a general awareness. Uh, you know, if, if you look at some of the things that are happening, if it, even if you talk about taxation, if you talk about tax avoidance and tax evasion, one's legal, one's not. You know, it's important that the police investigators know this. It's important that those in the bank know this. You know, that what are the indicators they need to look out for? And just have some, some, some level of cross-training around key agencies, FIU, you know, uh, attachments. Uh, and, and, and I keep going back to the Pacific because it's very small. It's easy to move people around, you know. Uh, I always use new as an example. The whole government organization is sitting in one room, you know, that's... Uh, converging in one room, so you know everybody's talking to each other. You know these are where you can pilot and scale some of these things. Eh? Um, yeah, uh, maybe maybe things like that. Thanks, Amnish. Uh, any comments? I agree with both of my counterparts, Russell as well as Tevita, in terms of um, I cannot um, emphasize enough on how the economic arrangements can really benefit, and it. it I mean. There's a true testament that uh, some of the FIUs in the region have actually 
sort of uh, had this uh, secondment arrangements whereby they have uh, seconded either their staff to um, other FIUs, or some of them have also started exploring about using their staff like a seconder to either a law enforcement authority or to a private sector financial institution. Because when you put yourself in the shoes of others in terms of detection and investigation, the whole AML framework, if you have walked in another person's role, you better understand as to what the challenges are. And then when you come back to your organization, you're able to implement those issues uh, that they are grappling with. And then you are able to understand from their point of view what the struggle is. For example, if when I was at the FIU, and I'd usually get to hear that the law enforcement would say that they would, um, uh, it would take them ages because the compliance officers at the banks would be so engrossed in their daily tasks that they would not respond to their search warrants for executing uh, bank statement records. And I now hear the frustration, I mean, uh, because definitely everyone has their own set of tasks to do, but at the end of the day, people don't realize that how much critical the investigation is and therefore everyone's struggling with resources. But if you kind of get to know where the, you know, the links are and you understand and you kind of are on the same platform of, you know, what the challenges are on the ground by other people through the secondment arrangements, you are better in a position to be able to then uh, capitalize on those strengths which they have and be able to expedite sort of the process. Right, right. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, all our panelists, uh, Devita, Russell, Avnish, also thank Arpita for that presentation before the panel. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I think it was it was great hosting all of you for this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you very also, much. Thanks also to the audience for joining us. Uh, I'd just like to remind the audience that all participants who are attending this session live will receive a free participation certificate. Uh, for that, please make a free registration on FinTech Academy so that the certificate can be sent to you. Um, and a recording of today's webinar will be available online later in case you wish to refer to it again or you need to uh, share it with colleagues. Uh, the link will be emailed to you tomorrow. Uh, with that, uh, we close the webinar today. Uh, have a great day, stay safe and stay happy. Thank you. You too. Thank you.